So I'm not sure if you've been paying much attention to the Olympics. It seems to be kind of the most downplayed Olympics in a long time. People aren't really paying much attention to it. Are you watching it? Any, anything? Anything? Anything at all? Small bit. Okay. It's amazing to see the different sizes and shapes of people in the Olympics, right? Because if you're aiming to excel in a particular sport, you can't really, it's very hard to be good at them all, unless you're a triathlon athlete like our dear Deacon, uh, then you can be good at all sports. Um, but for most people, they have to really specialize in something. So if you're going to be a gymnast, you have to be really tall and bulky, right? No. So if you're going to be a gymnast, you have to be small and super flexible. Right? That's why the gymnast career normally stops at about, I don't know, 20 or something. Apart from that, then you, just, you grow up and you're, you're not made of rubber anymore. Uh, so, or if you're going to be like a shot put uh, athlete, you know, stocky and strong. If you're going to be a, a, a weightlifter, right? aesthetics don't matter. If you're going to be a weightlifter, it's just all about bulk. Right? You just got to bulk and bulk and bulk and bulk and... Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it, it doesn't matter if you have HD brows and you're, you know, squatting. It makes no difference. You just have to just get on that weight. And, uh, and so all these shapes, and if you want to be a, a, a sprinter, okay, tall, being tall helps. <coughs> being lean and like zero fat, just maximum efficiency. So all of these, all of these runners or all of these athletes aim for something very, very specific because they can't be everything. In our, in our lives, see, we, we're limited. We're limited by all sorts. We're, we're limited by our bodies. You know, my body can only do so much, right? And as you get older, it can do less and less and less. You don't understand that yet, okay? You'll eventually have bad hips and stiff fingers like everyone else. Uh, but when, when you, you, our, we're limited by our bodies. We're limited by our intelligence. I, I can't understand everything. I can't remember everything. Maybe some of you just find languages just really, really hard. But you can remember all sorts of statistics about hurling and soccer, no problem but just maths won't go in or languages won't go in or, you know, it, it just, we're limited by our intelligence. We're limited by all sorts of things. So in our, in our, in our lives, we have to make choices. What, what am I going to do? What am I going to set as a priority? Because you can't have everything as your priority. You can't, you can't have everything in, in, in the first place. It, there isn't room, you know? If you're going to be an athlete, then there are lots of things you can't do. If you're going to be uh, an inter-county senior hurling player, you cannot do everything you want to do. Now, because I've made that choice, <clears throat> there are lots of other things I can't do. If I'm going to be on a senior panel, I can't go out on the weekend drinking all the time. I can't eat rubbish food. I have to eat lean food, high protein, so on. So making, make, there are certain choices that we make that affect all sorts of other choices in, in, the, in the world out there that's completely normal. Okay. In our faith, it's very, very similar. We can't just do everything or be everything. We, there's actually a, a call, like, I mean, if you will, like a responsibility placed on us to not just kind of be everything, but to be something very specific. And that's to be a disciple, to be a follower of Jesus. And when we do that, if that's in the first place, then lots of other things will find their place and lots of other things will simply be completely excluded. If I follow the Lord, there are certain things I can't do. Do you know what I mean? If, I, if I'm a disciple of the Lord, then getting, drinking to excess, all right? Or immodesty or certain behavior, certain talk even, certain programs on TV. Suddenly, I can't, I can't do these anymore. Now, this is a, a kind of a negative approach for the moment, but hold on a second. Um, you know, there are certain things I can't do. Because I follow the Lord, I can't do these things. It's just, they, they, they don't work like it's the, it's contradictory to this Lord being in the first place. Because how can I have him in, the, him in the first place and yet make all these compromises? It just it doesn't work. It's like if I'm if I'm married, well then there are certain behaviors I can't have with other women, right? Because I'm married, so certain things just I cannot do. Uh, Saint Paul, if you know much about Saint Paul, Saint Paul was a bit of a fighter. Uh, he was absolutely determined to know the truth. So he became a Pharisee. So he knew the law well. So he knew the, what we call the Old Testament. He knew the Old Testament very, very well. And he was adamant like to, to defend it and to defend the truth. So much so that when Jesus came around and Jesus' followers, St. Paul started persecuting Jesus' followers. Because he said, this is wrong. This is wrong. There's only one God and it ain't him because he died on the cross. So he started persecuting the church. So he, he has an awful lot of fire. When he converts then, he turns all that fire into like this, this, this disciple absolutely 
willing to do everything for the Lord. And my Greek teacher loved pointing out this one particular thing here. St. Paul says in our first reading, I believe that nothing can happen that will outweigh the supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For him, I have accepted the loss of everything, right? So Jesus in the first place. Jesus, top priority. For him, I have accepted the loss of everything. But to be honest, I look on everything as so much rubbish. I look on everything else, actually, as so much rubbish if only I can have Christ and be given a place in him. But my Greek teacher, don't tell anybody, liked highlighting the fact that St. Paul doesn't say the word rubbish. He says the word dog poo. Dead serious. So the word dog poo is in scripture. And St. Paul says, I look on everything else as so much dog poo. If I, so everything else is just absolute poop unless I have Christ. You know, he's, he's, he's like, he wants to be really, really blunt about this, right? Like, just in, in unequivocal terms, everything else is just absolute rubbish, right? Unless I have Jesus. Now, you'll, you'll remember that line, won't you? You'll never forget that word. Yeah, yeah there you go. So it's Philippians 3 8, just so you know. Um, so, so I think, like, this is, I, 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 St. Paul is really, really clear about this. If I have Jesus in the first place, then everything else, not only is everything else kind of just you know, certain things I can't do, certain things I shouldn't do, if I have Jesus in the first place, so many other things are simply just rubbish. Do you know, like, you know, if, when we think, if you look back on your life, imagine you're, you're 80 or 85 years of age looking back on your life, you know, and imagine during your life, I met a guy, for example, who said that his greatest goal in life was to get a Ferrari, all right? And he, there were pictures of him driving Ferraris, friends' Ferraris, and all this kind of thing. <clears throat> and he said, you know, and I'll never forget it, like, because he was dead serious. He said, I'd rather be miserable in my Ferrari than happy in a Ford Fiesta. And while I kind of agreed with him, I thought, no, actually, no, no, hang on, that's wrong. What do you mean? You'd actually, I'd rather be miserable, so I'd rather be unhappy but have material things, I mean, you're picking up what he said. I'd rather be happy. Sorry, I'd rather be unhappy. I'd rather be miserable and have lots of material things than be happy and be not so much poor, but even average, moderately wealthy. Because that's actually, I, I, unfortunately, I, I know this guy and I know the way he's living his life and that is the way he's living his life. He's quite miserable and making people around him miserable, but he's got plenty of material things. He's got an awesome Jeep with big off-road mud tires. He's got an awesome Harley. He's got an awesome house. But he's making everyone around him miserable. But he has all these material things. Then you've got St. Clair, who sees St. Francis living this radical lifestyle, where St. Francis and his followers, they lived out in a forest, and they, they became one of these, as they're called, mendicant orders. So mendicant is... A, a, from the Latin word meaning to, to beg. So they would actually beg for their food. Right? So they would go into houses. Hi, how are you doing? And he and he and he left over there. And then the family might give, you know, you know, our slop bucket in the kitchen. Yum. Imagine if that was your dinner. So here's the slop bucket. And they'd have the, they had the, these, their little begging bowls or their begging baskets and you know, just pour out some of the slop bucket. That's dinner. You know, so it, it was, it's, a, it's a radical lifestyle. So St. Clair sees St. Francis living this radical lifestyle. She's inspired. She said, I, I, I want that too. I, I want to live for this Jesus guy. And she gets to know who Jesus is. And then finally she says, that's it. Like, he's, he's my everything. He's my top priority. Actually, I consider everything else so much rubbish if I could only have him. And so she makes these vows, promises. Uh, in the presence of St. Francis, and she gets her, her hair cut off. I mean, that's a fairly drastic step, even for your good selves, centuries later, but back then it was equally so. <clears throat> there were no such things as fake clip-on hair extensions. Uh, so if you didn't have it, if you didn't grow it out, you didn't have it. <clears throat> so she takes this radical step in poverty, and then she holds on to that and says, like, we have to show with our lives that Jesus is enough. 
And so other girls start joining her and she lives this radical poverty. No meat, no shoes, a lot of the day in silence and no Wi-Fi. Not even a half an hour a day, right? So this, 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 this life of poverty. But not, rather than people thinking, oh, that's too, that's too extreme or that's too impossible, girls actually start to join her. And then the poor Clares is formed. That's back in the 13th century. So it's a, they were a long time on the go. But they did so, they followed her, because they saw that actually Jesus is enough. Now, two last points, if I may. On one occasion, uh, there was a lot of... Uh, Italy was very divided. It, it, it's, it's not one country uh, very long, only about a little over 150 years. So before then, it was just a lot of different kingdoms that would often fight for territory and land and so on. So on one, on one occasion, uh, Assisi, where she was, was being attacked by Frederick II, and she was quite aged, she was quite old at the time. And so, like the convent, I mean, if soldiers come into a convent where they're all women and young women, like the, the, the consequences aren't good. So she needed to defend her, her, her sisters. So she says, well, well, we'll use the only arm we have. And she asks for the Blessed Sacrament to be taken out of the tabernacle. And she processes with the tabernacle and places it up on a wall where the advancing soldiers could see it. And they all kneel down in adoration. And for some reason, the soldiers are thrown into confusion and terror and flee. And don't attack their convent, leave them completely unharmed. So her faith and power her faith in the power of the Eucharist. So when we think of Saint Clare, we think of a life lived entirely for the Lord and a confidence that Jesus is her everything, that Jesus is enough for her. Now, last point. Why is it important to believe that Jesus is enough? What if you believe that all I need is Jesus and the perfect body, or Jesus and uh, a senior hurling medal, or Jesus and... So, why, why, why would that be a problem? Why is it so important that Jesus is enough for us? Where are we all hoping to go? Heaven. And what's heaven? Heaven isn't just a better version of earth, because that would, wouldn't be great if I'm honest. Heaven is when we're taken into God, who is our everything, our all in all, our everything. He's everything we want. He's the complete fulfillment of every desire. The fulfillment of your every desire for all eternity. So it is essential for all of us, not just for the poor players, but for all of us, <clears throat> that we recognize that Jesus is enough for us, that God is enough for us. And that's actually why God has designed the human body as it is, that we start off helpless. Then you, we become as awesome as your good selves, able to, to run for hours and hours and hours and hours a day, perspiring bucket loads of sweat and healthy out and able to take hits and roll around and all good. And then you hit your 40s, 50s, the kind of the maximum of your influence in your life, and then you start to get old. 60s, 70s, then everything starts to kind of slow down. And all the gifts that we had, <clears throat> we have to start giving them back. Why? Because at the end of our lives, we have to know and be given the opportunity to choose. God is my everything, and God is enough for me. So even if I can't walk, God is enough for me. Even if I can't actually see anymore, like I used to be able to see, God is enough for me. Even if I lose those around me, God is enough for me. God is enough for me. And if I die knowing that God is enough for me, well then he will prove that. He will show that for all eternity, that he is enough for you. That's why it's so, so, so important that we get that priority right now, while we can. That Lord, you, you're my everything. You're enough for me. So I can, do, I can still do other things. I can, I can still have God in the first place and play hurling. I can still have God in the first place and enjoy life. I can still have God in the first place and have a beautiful family and career and all those things. I can do all those things as well. But it's a question of priorities. What's number one? And with God in the number one place, like everything else will find its place. 
but you put anything else up there and everything else will suffer. Whereas you put God in the first place and then we have the, the selflessness, the virtue, the grace available to us to make decisions in favor of the other. So St. Clair, St. Paul, all saints <clears throat> lived this beautiful reality as will our own Clara. That absolute confidence that God is enough for her. That absolute, the absolute surety that every pain and wound and insecurity and lack that she has or any of you have, that God is enough to fill that. That God can heal that. Do you imagine living? Imagine really believing that. Imagine really believing that. That God can be your everything. If we do, we discover what we read in the psalm. You, O Lord, will show me the path of life, the fullness of joy in your presence, at your right hand, happiness forever. May we discover that and may we live that for all eternity. Amen.